I want to start by just introducing myself. I'm sure most of you know who I am, given your working in performance marketing recruitment. I've done this for about six years now, and I wanted to use kind of the network that I built up to help people connect and learn. So this is where this webinar was kind of born out of. So I hope you enjoy it. Secondly, I'd like to give a massive thank you to our speakers this afternoon. We have Valentin, the founder of Up Collective, gives a wave. <laughs> we have Raphael, the performance marketing lead at Zoe, and we have Brad, the VP of growth at ArcDesk. They're going to talk us through three key areas today. That will be team structures, creative strategy and how to make winning ads and AI tools and creative. As we go through the deck today, um, please put any questions that you have in the chat box because we're going to try and answer the questions as we go. And we've also got time at the end for questions and we'll get through so much more if they're all there and ready to go. But yeah, that is it. That's all from me. And I'll leave you over to our speakers now. Brad, if you'd like to start with um, the first topic, team structures, that would be great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. And uh, Valentin, Raphael, good to see you again. Uh, been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you know, uh, we were chatting before, uh, you know, when trying to organize this uh, webinar, and we were talking about all the various components that go into making great ads and making sort of great ad machines, if you will. And teams and team structure was really a fundamental part of that. Um, and a couple of things that I've done in my, um, uh, I guess, fairly brief career has been really focusing on those first hires, the types of people you want in your team um, to really create that machine from the get-go. We know that in the world we live in now, creative is a hugely important part of any successful digital marketing campaign, if you will, whether that's on paid search or indeed on, I don't know, TikTok, right? Um, the, being able to ship creative and high quality creative that leads to high engagement, good sort of click through rates, et cetera, is fundamental. Um, and even more so, I guess uh, we'll talk about the, the, the other influencing factors later on. But this is, I guess, also more of a discussion, but a couple of the first hires I've made when joining a business, especially earlier stage businesses, has been a marketing designer. That's my first point of call, because when it comes to shipping rapidly, when it comes to iterating and testing ideas, um, I found having that sort of creative um, person outlet uh, in your team, first and foremost, coupled with another individual that has, of course, the, um, I guess, data-driven sensibilities um, is fantastic. The reason why I say marketing designer rather than uh, I guess other designer types, of course, is that they think in, I guess, a marketing commercial context. They aren't just, you know, creating pretty pictures. Um, even though I hate that term, what they are doing is is really they have the commercial considerations in place. What do you guys think? Um, cool, yeah. I. So on this idea, um, I'd say I agree with parts of it, but the one part, well, it depends on your sort of channel mix and what channels you're on. But let's say let's say you're on Facebook, which is sort of the a big channel for, I'd say, probably most people on this call. Um, you, there's, there's almost this part where instead of a designer, it's almost more of a creator. So, you know, a lot of content uh, that goes on ads. A lot of it is based on UGC and, and what performs. And I think that's no surprise to anyone here. But how you sort of really excel at that is sort of people who do this all the time. And sort of what I've done uh, at Zoe is actually, um, you know, like hiring people who actually have an organic like content background who can then be like, you know, translated into a paid more like, like structured, structured video type because if you can do organic really well you can easily do paid um so that's sort of the the difference in approach that, that i've taken um and i sort of like have uh like call this term like a full stack creator where instead of having like all the different parts of like let's say like a, a creative strategist uh a script writer 
uh, an editor. It's actually exactly. like all of these roles combine into one, into a full stack creator uh, that does the video from end to end. And what that also leads is to each person having a lot more like ownership in the team of their ad. Uh, and it um, essentially like create, makes it an environment for people to really create their best stuff. And if they can create their best stuff and align it with performance and that sort of data side of it, uh, you'll get really top winning ads. So that's so sort that's of really how I've done it. But uh, yeah, Valentine, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I would say actually, <laughs> not ideal timing. Um, I would say that maybe the, the most important piece that I found is, is uh, the, the creative strategist in that. So someone who kind of comes up with what are the exact, uh, <laughs> what are the exact concepts <laughs> um, that we're going to, that we want to run. And um, yeah, and basically really fleshes out that concept down to the script that we want to produce. Because I think if, if you can get someone to do that, then even a very junior designer could in theory, execute a really good ad um, with that sort of direction, making sure that the storytelling is right and all the kind of platform considerations. So I would almost kind of um, counter that with a, having a performance marketer that can also yeah. think beautifully um, could be sort of, yeah, yeah, be sort of my preference maybe. That actually goes back to, and, uh, and it's very interesting and valid points, I suppose, especially if you're, Hyper focused on a single uh, channel as as well, um, but it goes back to those days of I guess performance marketing on paid search, right? Where where the um, analyst or I guess performance marketer would be the person writing the ads as well, right? Even today, that's the case. So it's almost um, to Raf's point of having the full stack creator. It sort of add on the performance marketer to that stack as well. And then to your point, Valentin, um, uh, having all of those, I guess, capabilities, right? In terms of storytelling, building a strong narrative, that sort of jazz. Yeah. Do you, do you think that like a, a good head of growth should be able to do all those things? <laughs> Um, a good head of growth, well, it depends on the founder you you speak to, right? <laughs> a good head of growth is everything to everybody these days. Um, no, I think uh, from my perspective, um, if you have identified a channel opportunity, like, I guess, the Meta Network, for example, um, there should be some strong hypothesis there that um, why you think it could work and the mechanics of the channel. So I think you you should at least be able to understand what good looks like and in many cases be able to do the first iteration figure out all the speed bumps along the way before you then really have a grip on the type of profile you want to bring in maybe uh, or indeed the the learnings you want to pass on i think i think that's a really good point and i'd almost go a step further uh when like you know creating really good ads uh, you really need to have a very fundamental knowledge of like why that works. And when you're able to, you know, be like a, a full stack creator in the sense that like you, you can also make the ad, you get a lot more reps in into like knowing how, how and what works exactly. Uh, Cause you get like instant feedback from, from meta, from whatever channel. Um, and you can spin these out every week. Right. So your, your, your learning curve just accelerates more. And the better you really understand that, the better you can hire for it, the better you know what to look out for. Um, so I, I'd almost say that's like quite a key factor and something I haven't seen in that many uh, like heads of growth um, that they could sort of like do it themselves, which I think is an important factor. Yeah. 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 I mean, the um, <laughs> I remember walking around the office, right, with the phone trying to film anyone doing anything and. And I'm sure there's a lot of people still doing that, but I think, yeah, having someone that um, understands structure so you can, I guess, leapfrog a bunch of learnings, let's call it, uh, early, um, helps out helps out a lot. But, um, I mean, today where a lot of channels require storytelling more than ever, I think the head of growth today does have to get to grips with that those sort of skill sets right? mm. 
Mm, yeah, especially if it's like a a model where like Meta or TikTok is like your top of funnel driver. If it's maybe a paid search or like a, a search uh, driven model or something, then potentially it's more analytical and you're sort of doing more of the okay, where's the search opportunity, and let's just create a lot of SEO and run a lot of paid search. That's yeah. yeah. Potentially, actually, the easier job <laughs> than running a bunch of really high-performing ads. Yeah, I think when I was working in paid search specifically uh, a while back now, um, the I found the keyword research side of things. You know, the those sort of aspects was natural to me. It was pretty straightforward, pretty easy. But I'd be banging my head and hours trying to figure out, you know, the the, the ads and the variants and the experiments I wanted to run and the CTAs I wanted to test and all that sort of jazz, I think. Um, it's still an important skill set, right? And and I think whilst the formats are different, the thinking is often similar. You know, what do I want this person to take away and hopefully do after seeing my ad? I would, I would uh, sort of counter this with from like the general growth perspective whereas like you know search one first of all is getting a lot more automated in many many aspects so you can kind of like see where, where that's sort of going but search is you know limited to search demand whereas like if you want really want to scale uh like a company you really sort of need to go outside of that like that is a great baseline and like every company who sort of can can tap that should but there is that whole other segment of like going past that, but it is like a great and like a lot easier channel, I'd say nowadays. Yeah, um, and if there's so enough demand, you know, companies scale very happily on search, right? They don't need many other channels until very far into their uh, life cycle. Yeah, it's interesting. And I guess also, you know, with the um, point on the the channel mix, I think, there, there, there are more channels than ever today. Um, and having someone, I guess, Valentin, to your point, and Raph, to your, all of your points, is, you know, you, there's these fundamentals we you want someone to be able to bring in, which is, are you able to construct some sort of story, right? Do you understand that structure? And can you execute on it? <laughs> um, uh, uh, quickly, and I think that was my point as well, in terms of those types of hires, which is, executing and and iterating quickly is essential um and last point on i guess team structure again the reason why um creative marketing designers have always and i guess creatives now um have always been part of that sort of hiring mix for me is that there was a point with the meta automations as well where i was spending for one of the startups i was working at circa a million a month right on uh, meta specifically weighted towards Instagram. And it got to a point where we just removed targeting apart from country and and that was it. Let you do your thing algorithm um, and we'll focus on creative and getting that message sort of audience, you know, um, uh, in, uh, going. And that's what we did. So there was no, <laughs> probably should have been, but our audience was broad enough in a very big market uh, where 50 percent of the market was using a service like ours that um it just it just worked really well for us so again fast iterations on the creative a nice broad creative um spread touching on different needs pain points whatever you want to look at um and then letting the the platforms do their things of trying to identify the the ideal fit for you. There is mm -hmm. one final thing I sort of want to say on the stream st uh, team structure part, which is I'd say there's two main sort of metrics that you want to optimize towards outside of like, you know, CP and, every, and ROAS or whatever is two things. One is creative velocity. So it's like, how many ads are you able to like pump out every week? <laughs> Super important. Then the other big one is your creative win percentage. If you can have both of these in place, you can basically win at any channel. Um, and it's like all the top, all the best advertisers 
that that I've that seen. I've seen like, like you know, you go on their Facebook ad library, they have like hundreds and hundreds of ads, and you say they 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 pump them out like every week. Um, and you just you you get to like more winning ads that way. So it's like if you can set up your team to to succeed on those two things, creative velocity and creative win rate, like you will you will win anywhere <laughs> in performance that, marketing. That's maybe one of my final points there on structure as well. How do you get these people to make the creative ads? It's great to have the skill sets, um, but putting that culture in place, you know, the the growth mindset, the growth culture of we are going to pump out ads. We are going to learn as much as we can. Failure is sort of part of this process. Um, and also having the buy-in from the broader business on being brave with the type of creative you're putting out, right? There's nothing worse than putting something out that, and this has happened to me twice at two different businesses where you find your winning creative, everyone's high-fiving, you're the happiest you've ever been, um, only for someone on the board to, have a moment for some reason and for the ad to get shut down. Um, this is, <laughs> um, this is again, I think a broader company structural question on, you know, what sort of culture do we want in place? But I think embedding that culture when the people join your team, it's sort of a, there's no fear. What we're doing is iterating, learning, growing, and finding that velocity, that good cadence. And secondly, having the ambition just to constantly identify, learn, identify, and then scale these winning ad, let's call them formulas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe to that, maybe, yeah, maybe my final point on that one is um, just the, um, I think just getting stuff done is like, I think to me, the most important thing, I think is the danger is that ads get stuck in this loop of feedback and they never actually get launched. And I think even if it's not perfect, if, if the idea is kind of good and the execution is good enough, I think it's still good to get it out because Ultimately, the data will tell you if it's working. And there's been so many times where the, the ad that we felt the worst about actually did the best. And I'm sure you guys have had the same thing. You know, you think this is going to do amazing. It bombs. You think this that looks like, you know, doesn't look great. But then it's the uh, same how it's the winner. So, yeah. Yeah. On the of good, right? Yeah. On that, on that, on that point, 100% agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, this is, you know, a key thing to sort of build in the culture. And one like tip or way that sort of I've done it that uh, everyone here can uh, take from is uh, creating Great. like a, a safe space and sharing V zeros. So what I mean by that is uh, creating like, you know, either like a Slack channel, whatever your, your comms thing is, where you can share your, your like literal, like, literal, like your like first your cut of an ad or like even your idea uh, even if it's really bad, just for everyone to in the team to essentially give their like really early feedback on like, oh, maybe try this thing or whatnot, really kind of develops the the speed culture of like just putting stuff out there and not being worried. Um, and then also getting feedback to make it improve better. Um, yeah, that, that's the the sort of the big thing that uh, developing and, and what I call that sort of like a V0. It's like your really terrible version of an ad, just like put it out there. And then even if like you don't continue, it's like just launch it anyways. As you said, a lot of counterintuitive ads yeah. will win. And you're like, oh, wow. You get humbled like every other week. Like I did not think that would win. And then it wins. So, so yeah, that's a, that's yeah. a great yeah. point. Nice. We have um, two questions, but I think we should answer them at the end and move on to what makes creative strategy and how to make winning ads, Valentine, if that's okay, just for time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, just giving one or two examples uh, of like good ads and also just through a process that we we use to basically make these ads and what does you know what does a good look like. I'm keen to hear you guys' feedback on if you think that's a good process. Um, and yeah, I think do you have next slide? Um, yeah, and then the next one. Um, so. so Basically, maybe just a question for you guys. Do you think this is, um, I pulled this from uh, Lestrange. Um, it's a video ad. Um, it's about 15 seconds long or so. Um, and I thought it was a good example to deconstruct because it's sort of quite clear in the structure. So just keen to hear you guys' thoughts. Do you think this is good? And like, yeah, so what do you think would be the sort of things that make it, make it a viable ad?
Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I can start on this. So uh, I think the structure is is fine. <laughs> I think uh, it like it really like like what I find what, is, like a lot of different companies like they like have they, to slightly uh, tweak the structure. It's like if it's a higher price product or like something that doesn't have a lot of like inherent trust in that industry, like this social proof thing will come in really good at the beginning. Um, so I'd say it, there's a big caveat like it depends what industry and like product you're you're marketing, marketing here. here. Um, uh, but in terms of like the hook, always key. Uh, the attention, sort of having the one line sentence, also great. I've seen that work on lots of other advertisers and ads. Um, I would almost have a more engaging visual with this, to be honest. And you could even put this even on like a TikTok box um, and then someone like answering that. Or uh, yeah, I'd say like it's very high produced type of ad, uh, which can work. Um, but yeah, just more expensive to make. And then, yeah, in terms of the like CTA, I don't have to go into that one. Uh, and then the why it's true, um, is it, I, I, I don't actually get that. Is that, what is this saying exactly? <laughs> it's like the, the, the sort of like the, the benefits of this product or like why, why you should get it. Like why it's, why it's actually real kind of thing or what? Yeah. Sort of why it does simplify your life. So it's sort of, you know, you're wasting less time, you're making less choices and all this kind of, that kind of angle. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I think for for me, this structure is interesting, but also I think I'd improve it in certain areas. So I don't know if many of the listeners here or, or you guys indeed, I'm sure you do both do uh, know who Hypebeast is, but they're very well known, well respected in that particular space. Um, so some of the things that I would do um, here is, well, if you've got strong trust, strong brand awareness, but trust within that brand, the social proof aspects are, I guess, less less needed, right? You don't have to emphasize them. I guess to Raf's point earlier, you don't have to waste seconds on convincing people that you're a brand worth trusting. Um, the second thing I'd probably add here in terms of that attention um, piece, so you know you got one, one second to get another three seconds, let's say, right? Is I would bring in that, you know, if the brand is supersedes the social proof in terms of brand trusting and um, gravitas, I'd actually bring that a lot earlier in as well. That, you know, this is high beast talking, so I don't have to wait three, five seconds, whatever it is, to find out that this is something that is being presented by high beast. Um, I think these sort of things are um, important. I've also seen ads where you have a, a bookmarked CTA. So you tell people what you want them to do coupled with the attention hook. Um, and then you sort of reinforce that towards the end. Um, Structure-wise, uh, to the point, I think it's it's pretty okay. Would have looks like it would have been quite expensive to produce. Um, so a very unlikely unless you have a big bank of creative uh, of sorry of uh, collateral to really be able to iterate and you know so you're the, it looks like they'd be putting um, a big bet on the one ad is the feeling. So I think structurally it's okay, but I feel like for a brand like that, just to summarize, I would lean on that brand's gravitas a lot more than the, you know, the featured in social proofs type stuff. Um, and I'd shorten the ad and and um, focus on the benefits um, a lot more. For some reason, and this is maybe just a personal thing and that are subjective ultimately, I don't like that there's a different CTA <laughs> that we've got to explore now versus learn right. more at the end, right? I feel like um, we want to be very consistent with what you're asking of the viewer, of the buyer, um, and presenting sort of a different ask can also, again, create some analysis paralysis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that you guys both uh, bring up this sort of expensive production because I think nowadays um, what you see a lot working is like UGC or sort of like like what Raphael was saying earlier is like TikTok style that uh, that could almost be an organic proposition that then just gets sort of turned into a paid ad. Um, I guess for these guys, it's because it's luxury fashion. They they sort of yeah purposefully stray away from that, and and that's sort of something that. Can be, can be, I guess, in the, in the brand context. 
Um, but but it, it's very, I think, dependent on the industry. And most industries, I think UGC probably is the thing that, um, while it's cheaper to produce, faster iteration, and, and um, tends to work probably better as well as can disguise organic content, maybe. Um, yeah, I think the structure of a UGC type ad or an ad that is, you know, designed to fill native, if you will, um, is mm -hmm. often very similar, right? It's it's the same in some ways. It's just how it's produced. Um, there are some U UGC style ads. Um, a couple of companies do them, and you pay, you know, tens of thousands to get these ads produced. Um, but um, so they made to, you know, it's like a something it's a udc style ad not a um no. and but the structure i think mm -hmm. is often the same right you've got your hook your attention grabber your um your reason to believe and your call to action ultimately the other point in this yeah. is that that i haven't heard much of is kind of like the the whole storytelling aspect and i feel like you could dive like like several yep. levels deeper into this um but yeah i know brad you mentioned it earlier on like the storytelling and like a part like a, a big like inspiration for me is actually looking at like organic content and how they tell story again they make like so many more videos um and uh someone who was really good recently that i found this week is this uh girl called the uh, jenny hoyos there's a great interview on youtube you can like link it at the end um but really goes into like extreme depth on the creative and like the whole like story arc and sort of like you know how do you like for like shadow the ending the of of the story visually without saying it and like keep creating like a, a loop of a story that you close at the end there's like so many i feel like levels you can go to this <laughs> that i don't think we'll go into for this but um yeah, I think I would definitely like have a big focus on that like storytelling aspect in the in the ads themselves. Interesting. Yeah, I think you could actually probably take this hook and you know you could come up with five different ways that that ad ends, and they could be completely different. And you might you know uncover some different angles. Um, and that's probably good uh, things that you know I think uh, you both have probably experimented with that sort of stuff. What is a better hook? Let's do the same ad, but test different hooks, let's test different call to action. So um, people in performance and growth tend to sort of dissect these and test elements, right? Rather than testing an entire story. Yeah. Um, but I think you can tell a story in, you know, 11 seconds, um, I think definitely. But then again, I've seen fantastic ads work really well where they are 30, 20, 30 second long ads, fantastic ads. Um, I think you're right. It's just how uh, I think that ultimately it's the same thing, right? Uh, and it's the same when you read a story. What do you want someone to take away from this? How do you want them to feel? Uh, what do you want them to feel? Then act and do, right? This is mm -hmm. the main sort of criteria. Um, um, and sorry, just um, because I have another <laughs> another slide actually. Right? That's really about the process, but it was a good kind of chat on that story. Um, so the so the sort of the the main idea behind um, how we make ads and um, and how uh, the process that we go through for making these ads is a five step um, maybe there's a, yeah, a six step um, that we basically run through and <laughs> that I that I purposely left out um, it's basically um, there's a research phase uh, which I'm sure you know everyone's aware of um, and I think if I had to pick one 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 phase is basically that that's the most important one um, and it's sort of uh, where you like decide where you want to play you know what emotional messaging are you going to use so through review mining through actual customer interviews and um, through ad library research of google uh, facebook's ad library um, there's like more and more information coming out which rafael is going to talk about later a bit um, you know you can you can kind of really get to what are other people's winners? So that can already narrow down and eliminate a lot of stuff that isn't going to work and so focus on the strongest ideas. And then once that's complete, move to the concepting phase where um, you prioritize, like, okay, well, what does that concept look like and feel like so that you can brief it, prioritize the strongest ideas, um, and, and then write, okay, what's the hypothesis behind that? Like, we think that our customers care about this particular benefit or they have this pain point 
And so we're going to explore that. Um, and then it's on to actually writing the scripts. Um, yeah. And once you've written the script and stuff, you brief the designers. And I've written on there on a call because I've briefed people before um, in a Slack message, and it just doesn't work in my experience. Um, like there's so much nuance to add that you have to, and, and how you communicate that idea. I think that's really important to have that conversation face to face, um, or at least on a Zoom call. Um, and um, yeah, and then once that's sort of done, you go back and forth, you produce the actual ad until it's approved. Hopefully, not too many reps until you get that out the door. Um, and um, yeah, and then you go into the launch phase. You've hopefully defined the benchmarks of like this is if it if it hits these benchmarks, then we do X Y, and if it doesn't, then then we do something else. Um, and we, um, I, we would recommend to normally run those ads for at least a week, if not two weeks, um, depending yeah. obviously on the budget. Like <laughs> Raphael Shaky said, I'm curious to hear what you think. Actually, yeah, let's just like, why not why not discuss it now? <laughs> that for that part. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. so on this, I think you could do this much faster as well. So it depends like what your your uh like you know target metric is. If it's like CPA and it's like a, a like a very expensive item, it can cost you a lot and take a lot of time to sort of get to that. So one way we've actually solved that to speed that whole process up is to use uh what I call like proxy metrics, which is essentially like if you have like for let's for Zoe anyways, it's like a quiz. And about halfway through, you have to submit your email. Um, and we basically feed that data back into Facebook. And if we see like a cost per email is like uh, like five pounds, for example, let's say that's like really good. I'll be like, cool, like keep running that ad. If that ad is on like a 20 pound cost per email, it's like we already know that ad is not feasible before getting to like those CPA uh, sort of targets. So it's a way to essentially like speed up that whole process, waste less money on testing and get learnings faster. So I'd say you could do it a lot faster than like one or two weeks. You could do it in like a couple of days tops. So I guess, I guess there's a couple of things here. The leading indicators are important. Click through rates, great rights and other indicators. If you get email, awesome. Um, I've had, I have been burnt there where we've had this um, CPC, which was on the floor and a CPL in, in the B2B space, which was incredible. Um, and then when we actually looked at the contacts, we were like, pump the budget, pump the budget. Um, we found that they were all job seekers and completely rubbish. So I think there's that balance, um, but you know, which is leading indicators, super important, super valuable, um, I firm believer, but then also you need to have quick validation, right? Um, of the, uh, uh downstream, um, uh, metrics as quickly as you can because yeah, it, it can bite sometimes. And that was the strangest thing, why that ad didn't work. We relaunched it or we had a companion with a different CTA and the CTA was join now rather than get started. And join now, it seemed like job seekers thought, well, I'll join this business. <laughs> very, very random learning. Um, the only area I think that this um, uh, improves or the process speeds up as well is of course, you know, if we are going to, if you're going down the experiment route, um, you need enough data to run a valid experiment. Otherwise, um, I think be upfront with yourself and your team about that right at the start, right? There's a big enough audience for us to get to significance quickly enough. And if there isn't, then you're just making, you know, um, you, know you just have to make a call. But I think if you've got an embedded team, um, a team right where, you've hired creators rather than outsourcing. Um, mm -hmm. You start getting a flow with folks, right? Your sprints become quicker. Your briefing process becomes shorter because they get to know you a bit better, right? And all these things tend to speed up pretty rapidly. Um, and then lastly, instead of the phone call, I'm a big fan of doing things asynchronously and having like this final powwow together. Um, try doing a little loom and I accompany my briefs with a video brief where I talk through it and I highlight it mm -hmm. and act with the video. This helps a lot because um, you're delivering that all in one shot. They can consume it, watch the video on 2X, 
um, unless they have too much time in their hands. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you go into the sort of, I guess, um, synchronous process, but as much as possible, try to do it asynchronously because then you can get on with other stuff, right? I, We've actually, yeah, um, I think maybe, oh, sorry. <laughs> so one, I was... one quick point that I left out at the start um, is that I think something that I've seen where it breaks this process often is the feedback to the designers. And I think um, that's actually probably one of, that's where it becomes a flywheel, right? Because otherwise it's just a process that repeats. Um, and I think that's something, and I, and I will still have to do better on that, like feeding, because as performance marketers, we're like in the data, looking at the ads management, like it's great, it's scaling. But actually we forget to give that feedback to the designers. And I think that's um, super important. Um, so that they also know why it's good and they can then build that into their future concepts. Yeah. yeah. I. I did want to say one final thing sort of on the previous slide with like the different steps. Uh, speed is like something you always sort of need to optimize towards. Um, and a way on, uh, can we go to the previous slide? Is that, is that possible? Yeah. So on this, like, so I, I fully agree on the research phase. Uh, that's like super, super important. And you get a lot of like gems from that. The concepting, copywriting, production, feedback. And like launch part is sort of where I've verticalized it all, um, where essentially you like you help people level up, become you help level up people in, in a sense that they become creators, like they can do this whole stack essentially, um, and then it becomes more automatic. But in order to do that, you need to. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll go into this a bit later, but sort of like you know in copywriting, this is like a there's this tool like practice called copy work, where you like copy really good copy. <laughs> Uh, getting super meta here and you kind of do the same thing with uh with like creators where it's like you have them like copy really good ads uh like almost frame by frame until they sort of get like the frameworks and understand like what works and then they sort of do all of those steps like uh themselves so it's like one way i found to sort of speed up that whole process but it only sort of works if like everyone is like more of a full stack creator but yeah i did just want to put that yeah, yeah. Just, just one point there just on that final that you mentioned, I suppose that depends on the experience levels as well, right? So if someone comes in they and they they understand structure and narrative, um, that learning process is uh, shorter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. And um, I was going to say, we've had a few questions. Shall we go through maybe one or two of those now before we go on to the last topic? Um, just to... We can answer some of them. Can you guys see them in the chat box? I can see one. Um, just at the top chat. I can read them then. If you don't. Um, I'll read one. So um, someone's asked, what is a good creative win rate for meta ads and LinkedIn ads? How do you measure this? How do you measure this metric and track it? So cool. I can, yeah, this one. Uh, I'd say like you want at least 10%, that's like good. So it's like, if you launch 10 ads, you want like one to win. Uh, and you sort of define that based on your own metrics of like, you want it to have more than like 50 conversions at whatever CPA, you sort of you define sort of that internally. Uh, but it's like, you said that, and then you track like, you know, how many ads are you uploading and how many ads are winning? And then you get that percentage essentially. And you want to aim for 10 or above. Yeah, I think nice. that's reasonable reasonable percentage and then someone's asked one directly for you Raphael <laughs> said oh, what's Dan, yeah. um what's a good benchmark for creative velocity so like in a good like if like, you want like really excellent from what I've seen I don't even do this yet I'm trying to do this but uh what I've seen like really really pros is uh like 100 per week uh and that includes like iterations and stuff but yeah 100 like ads per week are those you'll, you'll um, are those exact like new like my benchmarks generally two concepts per week and then various iterations which can go into mega amounts of course but would you say that's a hundred that's not a hundred concepts per week right not a hundred concepts no but like at least like, like a, quarter a quarter of that <laughs> depends how big the team is but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Budget. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because I think, yeah, you're right. The the velocity is so important. You've got to 
just got to try to produce as many as possible and iterate as quickly as possible, right? Um, so if you can do 100 per week, you uh, like do it. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Should we go to topic three and then we'll save the last few minutes for the rest of the questions? Oh, cool. Yeah, so this one. Um, so on the point of so tool, tools are really important in this space. Um, it sort of helps you like essentially have shortcuts. Uh, and one of those shortcuts that like uh, Valentine was like referencing to before is sort of like this like ad library research and competitor research. If you can look at like, you know, even a, a similar competitor or a competitor in a different vertical and know like what ad is, is working for them, you have a much higher chance of getting a winning ad um, by like copying their ad yeah. and like iterating on that with your brand. Um, however, like, Previously, this was really sort of difficult to figure out, like out of, you know, hundreds of ads, like which one is actually the winning one. And you can easily get burnt by copying the wrong ad and it just tanks for you. And you're like, ah, it's just like discouraging for everyone. So, so that's why it's that's really, like really important, important to, to know which, which of the which like the hundreds of ads are actually like their, their winning win. ad. Um, so I sort of want to, if we go to the next slide here, uh so i made this demo video today so me and my brother actually made this tool to sort of help with this exact uh problem to sort of know like out of uh, like competitors which ones are the top ads and there's been a, a change in like four or five weeks ago in the eu regulation where you could actually see all of the reach data on every ad that is advertised in the eu so if so, we play the video i can maybe i can do a, a live voiceover on this but um, essentially, it's a Chrome extension that will overlay finding out this information. And this is like sped up here. It might take like a minute to sort of get all the ads, but then it'll then rank based on how much reach each ad has had and sort of like an estimated ad spend. So you can see in like, you know, one click, which of these brands from this brand is the top ad, uh, which is really helpful to know like what to use as inspiration um for sort of the the reasons i mentioned before um and then i'm just and then in the rest of this uh sort of video um it's just like other brands examples that i like already like preloaded um so it's like loop earplugs is like uh, quite a big one they run a lot of performance and they're based out of germany and then picture this is like that app plant and i'm sure you've seen their ads uh and they have a great visual storytelling uh element it's like all of their ads are essentially like like no like, voiceover which is if you can create a story just visually that's like you know like, kudos to you that's really tough um so yeah that's sort of like what this allows you to do and sort of like helps you skip and save so many steps uh by doing that and i sort of like use this all the time now and sort of like make like as a also in valentine's like, like a swipe file of like winning ads um and again super helpful for like inspiration on uh future ads and then the other part which is uh if we go to the next slide which is more on the like using ai um i'd say uh in this space because I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the, the whole ai space but essentially uh you can also do the same thing with youtube ads and youtube ads are a lot more script heavy the script is a lot more important i'd say than even facebook or meta um and you can instantly see like which from their from the ad library on google which is the top ad so this is actually the zoe one <laughs> and you could basically get the whole transcript which is really good if you want to get an idea and you even get the unlisted video so i'm not like logged into my account here um and then yeah you get the transcript and then the other part is this ai breakdown of the script itself so it kind of tells you like why this works and why this doesn't work um, I should have definitely spent more time on that frame, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it kind of gives you like a couple of bullet points of reasons, like why, why it works and why that is really important. Because if you can understand why something works, you can easily replicate it, um, and do it for your own ads. And that's like kind of going down to that fundamental reason of why, uh, something works. And uh, there's another example with like Huel, um, so yeah, that was sort of like quick thing. I'm really curious to hear like what you guys think on like competitor, like research and sort of like winning ads and, and all of that. Yeah. Um, 
for me, I think the the competitor research side of things is interesting because um, I've seen it. Uh, I've spoken to a few other people where you see a competitor copy your worst performing ad and you sort of sit there and giggle and then you go and do the exact same thing, right? <laughs> um, so this, I think, happens a lot. I think the, the, the inspiration side is important, but I think what you have to ultimately do is go, you know, take your own path, right? So I'm a big believer in sort of SOPs standard operating procedures. How are we creating this ad? What is our truth today? So initially get the inspiration from as many sources as possible, get the learnings, look at, I mean, this sort of stuff's amazing, right? Um, uh, or, you know, wet dream sort of stuff. Um, but, but I think ultimately you've got to define what works for you, your brand, your budget, your team, um, and get that into a living SOP which is living for a reason, right? Because your truth keeps evolving, platforms keep evolving. Um, however, I do also think, uh, I guess final point on that is that inspiration is important, right? It's constantly important. And what I've had often is like a Friday sort of, I don't know, 3 p.m., get the team, especially if you're in sort of a squad in the office, talk about your weeks, performance, and then have a good 20, 30 minutes where you're just looking at creative ideas, especially when, you know, you've gone through your prioritization list and you're a little bit sucked dry, right? You're like, God, I've got nothing more. I've got no more um, ideas here. Oh, there's five minutes left, it tells me. Um, and I think that sort of thing, right, where you grab a beer or a fruit juice or whatever your preferred um, liquid is um, and just have a look at some things, right, and just talk amongst yourself about why you think that's cool or not and just keep those creative juices flowing. I don't care if you work as the performance marketeer or the creative uh, executor. I think having, being inspired, right, um, is uh, valuable irrespective of your role. Even if, you know, in that session, people are talking about the latest book they read or this concept from a, a sci-fi novel. I think all these things are really valid just to keep creativity flowing rather than um segregating it just to an advert because then you're limiting yourself in terms of what you can do the what the possible could be yeah i, I would agree with that i think um and i think the way that i tend to think about the the sort of sources of where ads come from is kind of you know maybe it's like copying or being inspired by competitors is one and then one is sort of customer interviews research the kind of more original and then maybe that's just like yeah, just yeah, an idea that just comes out of, you know, not necessarily having done research. If you're thinking about ads all day, you're going to have had ideas um, of like, you know, why, why don't we try this? Um, and then I think iteration is another one. So like basically being inspired by your own past performance, um, which can sometimes be a bit the most boring part because, you know, you, you've seen the ad a hundred times, but it, you know, it works. So maybe there's a different way to skin that cat and sort of, Give it another life and um, so i guess when we prioritize we try and make sure we have something from all of the streams so that we're not too reliant on like what we're doing today or what someone else is doing, doing. Um, yeah i guess the biggest impact of this is just like what i was saying earlier with like the creative win rate that just like improves that percentage basically it's like you're going off like proven models versus like something completely untested and eventually yeah i totally agree like you need to like venture, like venture out, out and sort of have your own thing but as like a a base or you need a new winner like now it's like this is a great way to sort of do that and it doesn't solve the whole problem you know as, as you guys kind of lead it to but it is a great sort of like shortcut <laughs> yeah. definitely I, I i fully agree um what, what would be interesting is if you sort of copy verbatim <laughs> although, yeah, that one's tough. <laughs> although the one thing I'm always mindful of is, you know, formulas work because they novel very often and they work for a reason. And once people have been exposed to these formulas, however many times they start, you know, you have to find that new formula. So I think, again, what works today, what's your truth today, what's your competitor's truth today um, is not going to be their truth tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah. Conscious, we have two yeah. minutes left, so. <laughs> yeah, we started um, a little late, so we can probably run over if anyone wants to stay on just to get through a few questions. We'll probably go over a few minutes. Um, 
so I'll read some through now. Um, so someone's asked, how about statistical, re statistical relevance? A hundred a week is great, but how do you make sure it is not external factors in impacting performance temporarily? Um, from my perspective there is, I guess, from the points I made earlier, you've got to understand that there's enough volume there for you to get that, uh, for you to have an audience where if you slice them up by the count of ads, that you're going to have enough volume, right, um, to get to significance. There's lots of statistically uh, statistical significance calculators out there, so you can do some estimations um, yourself. Um, but I think I would start from that sort of, is there a big enough audience here for us to run a valid experiment? Um, and if the answer, and, you know, audience or budget, right? Um, if the answer is yes, then keep plowing in. And if the answer is no, I think rein back your ambitions. So I, I, have a I have a really interesting counter to this. And coming from like a physics background, this is like crazy for me to say, but I'm almost like, I think most of the time you don't need to get to significance. It's like it's when like you see a winning ad, you will see it are like from the get go within the first hours, it'll perform like twice as good. If it's a really good winner than like your other benchmarks. And in order to sort of like de-risk that like week on week volatility, you compare between the ads. That's how to, that's how you sort of de-risk. Uh, that aspect, but yeah, if you have a winning ad, you'll know like very. When you know, you know, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, someone else has asked Raphael roughly, what is the percent of your time that is spent on creatives day to day? Um, oh, we like in a week. It's like yeah, I make ads like every week, <laughs> um, and I usually block out like a day in a week. Uh, where I like, I do the whole like concepting. So we already have a backlog of like all research and everything. It's more like the concepting and then filming. And usually when I'm like filming something, I find, oh, actually this looks better visually and I'll just change it on the spot. That This happens to me all the time. So that's why I don't like to follow like a very strict brief. If I know sort of what works, it's different like when you're sort of outsourcing that. But yeah, I do like a one day a week, uh, really focus on that. And then you pump out a couple ads. And then, and then you multiply this with more people and outsource as well. But yeah. Nice. Um, another question, another question then from Millie. When looking at past successful creative, what elements do you review to determine the success of the creative, e.g. structure, structure, offers, stimuli, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to take this. Um, I think, I mean, well, it, it depends kind of on the industry, I would say, but I, for like yeah, being an e-commerce marketer, it's a ROAS. So if the ROAS is great, then that's sort of the, you know, that's the benchmark that we look at. Um, and then looking, working backwards, okay, what what is it that made this ad work? And we compare, I would say, hook rates, engagement rates, click-through rates, conversion rates, um, to understand then, okay, what part of the ad made this a great ad? And hopefully all parts are good. Um, but to make it a winning ad, I guess all parts have to be good. But um, then you can understand, okay, is it actually the hook that is driving the performance of this ad? Can we reuse this hook for something else? Or does it have higher than average conversion rate? Then it's, well, the qualification of this ad is better than other ads. So let's look at the body and see, okay, why does it educate people in a way that other ads don't? And also then you can sort of de deconstruct and then hopefully do a better version of it the next time. Nice. Um, and then just one more to finish off, which I think my could be answered by Brad. I know you've got some strong B2B experience. So someone's asked, what are your thoughts on image ads on Meta for B2B SaaS? Any good or even worth trying? Give it a go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that I had a chat with someone about this yesterday, right, which is that B2B um, marketeers are way too hung up on these traditional B2B channels and activities, and they forget that when you leave the office, you're a you're a human being as well, right? You're, you're not this different person, you know, even while at the office, you're scrolling on your preferred social network. So I think those barriers that people have traditionally had in terms of what is seen as a B2B channel is completely bogus. And I think that um, running ads on the meta networks, running ads on TikTok for your B2B audience is as valid as any other channel. Um, and you should experiment and see if you can make it work. Nice. Um, 
if it's image ads or video ads, I really wouldn't care. I think there's a, a plethora of opportunities to explore that. Perfect. I guess follow up is like, what, what would you say in a specific <laughs> static B2B uh, image ad to make it work? What would be like your pro tip on that? Just so it's I'm, uh, I'm, actionable. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give you an example of one. I'm, I just finished off or uh, did some work for a, a fintech business and our best performing ad there, static, was a meme. Uh, so when we talk about like storytelling and narrative and getting concepts across very quickly, we found that this the, and a series of memes worked so much better because it was able to get an idea across instantly uh, <laughs> to our uh, Chagrin, I suppose, but you know, this is the freedom I had to run those types of experiments and a meme worked great. It did everything we wanted it to do uh, in terms of getting people's attention, hooking them in, telling the story, getting across a complex uh, uh, idea and, um, and a, a call to action along with us. So I don't have an exact answer off. I think that structure is you know um dependent on what you're promoting as well whether it's uh, i don't know an ebook or whatever but i think yeah memes would yeah great. So i guess it a yeah <laughs> point, test a lot i'll i'll, I'll uh i because i used to do a lot of b2b stuff as well so like some things i found that like worked well for me that could be actionable is like one using hands in your images is like always a winner <laughs> that I've had. It's like if you have a physical product, it'd be maybe a bit more difficult if it's like SaaS. But if you can like have some sort of physical form and hold it in an image, it'll crush. Uh, using a whiteboard and sort of visualizing that story in this like lo-fi way as well. I've seen this work on. I've personally made this work on so many different verticals. Um, is another really good one if you can like pull that off. Um, is this the is two this... tips I'll uh, give out at the end for everyone who stayed this long? <laughs> no, thank you, um, everyone, for joining. We will we'll follow up with a recorded kind of version of the webinar and a blog, and we will follow up with that Chrome extension Chrome. file because a few people have asked. Um, but yeah, we'll make sure you've got all the details. And thank you so much for joining, everyone, and all the questions. Loved it. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye.